Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Soccer Happy Hour. Andy Petrillo alongside Carmelina Moscato, Laura Armstrong. So pleased to be joined this week's edition by Kadisha Buchanan, 2016 Olympic bronze medalist, 2015 World Cup Young Player of the Year. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you guys? We're hanging in there. I don't think we've gone crazy yet, although debatable. Yeah, I hear you. Same. Yeah. <laughs> so where, where are you self-isolating right now? Um, I'm home uh, right now. I just did a workout with the team. So I'm at my uh, sister's house. Okay. So you guys yeah. are still keeping in touch and doing the workouts and yeah. Yeah. We, three times a week, uh, we'll have a zoom call um, with the Canadians women national team and we all hop on and endure thing there. Mm -hmm. So take us through your, your journey even to get back to Toronto, because we're, we're going to get into your playing career, your professional career, playing in France. Um, but right. we understand that when everything was going down in March, the Canadian national mm -hmm. team was actually in France for a tournament. That's also where you play. So right. what happened? Did you, opt, did you opt to stay in France? And then what was that journey like to get home? Um, well, so after our little camp in France, uh, a few of my nieces wanted to come to France for uh, their March break. So we kind of planned that already. So they came over and I think they left maybe three days later. Uh, so that was crazy in itself. Um, so if it was just me personally, I think I would have probably stayed a little bit longer to see um, how the corona viruses in France and whatnot, but um, I had my three nieces there with me, so um, I didn't want their moms to worry about us getting stuck in France, so uh, it was a kind of a journey to get um, out of France because a lot of uh, the surrounding uh, borders were closed, so it's not like I could have went to France, like Frankfurt back home, which is the normal route that I take, and so I had to go, um, I had to drive to Switzerland uh, uh, I had to drive, to drive to Switzerland that night because their border was closing at like 12 a.m. and it was kind of hectic. And as I was telling my niece, like, come on, like, let's get packing. They're like, ha ha, auntie, you're joking. Ha. They're like laughing. I was, I was like being super serious. Uh, I try not to like snap at them because I was like feeling under the pressure as well. So I'm just like, no, like, no, like, let's, let's, let's pack your stuff. We're going now. So we end up um, going to Switzerland, spending the day and going back to Toronto the next day. Wow. That's so crazy. Well, even, yeah, that is, that's a crazy story. So even till this day, that was, you know, for safety reasons, the right decision. Had your nieces not been there, you said you may, may have stayed in France. Do you think, what would that have been like for you, hypothetically now, obviously? Um, we still would have been in like quarantine. Uh, France was under lockdown, so I'm actually glad I left when my nieces were leaving or so I would have stayed and not spent time with my family um like France was under like major lockdown like in by like eight um you can't go certain um yards outside like where you live so um their their restrictions were a lot more serious than here so I'm glad I, I left when I did hmm. I'm picturing you behind the wheel of a car like just pedal to the metal, trying to cross those borders before they close them up on you just to get back home. And I don't mean to laugh because I think it was serious no. for a lot of people, no. but you made it home. And then of yeah. course your nieces are, you know, probably just lounging thinking, no way is this real? Like I can't even imagine trying to convince them that this is a pandemic and this is yeah. serious. You may not it was, be able to get it. It's kind of sad though that they came down here for the March break and then they they didn't get a chance to stay. So we'll, we'll have to rebook them some other time. Yes, you will. France is absolutely um, stunning, but let's go back in time a little bit. 2015, so that World Cup was on home soil. Uh, it was in Canada and you end up winning the FIFA uh, Women's Young Player Award. That year, you were also named the um, Canadian uh, Female Player of the Year, which ended Christine St. Clair's 11 year run. Um, so it was, it was different to see a, another name and it was so nice to also see you recognized, but I'm curious about, you know, so the position you play center back, like mm -hmm. a goalkeeper, you're very, you're, you're the leaders on the pitch as far as you're vocal, you're setting lines, you can, you're mm -hmm. looking out, directing play. 
And I'm just wondering, you know, your development in that position, even what made you choose to be a center back and, and how would you describe your leadership skills on the pitch? Oh, well, I didn't really choose to be a center back. I feel like a lot of center backs were never a center back. I don't feel like, it's like how a lot of strikers were always strikers in their life. I feel like as a center backs, they were never ever like a born to center back. Like I feel like they're always, they're always like converted as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with that, with that being said, like I feel like it's a longer development because you weren't, you weren't playing this position your whole life. Um, like people chose this position for you. So it's like, I feel like it's a lot harder to learn. Um, but on the contrary, I feel like for me, like growing up as a center forward and now defending center forwards, like you kind of have like those natural instincts and you, you know, like what a, a striker might do in this scenario and it's easier to defend, it's like chess. Yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. When did your, you, you mentioned longer development, like how, who chose the position for you? How did you get pushed into that, that spot? Um, I think Brian Rosenfeld, I think you 16, you 17, mm -hmm. um, from, I think I was a striker up to 14, 15. And then I slowly tried like outside winger. And then I tried outside back. Um, I remember you 15, I got my first national team camp. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I was outside back. And then I, the next year, you 15, you 16, you 17, I was converted to a center back by Joey Lombardi or Brian Rosenfeld. They had that kind of conversation. <laughs> they look like geniuses now, eh? They might be getting some royalties for that decision. But, um, you know, when I did see you go into that position and obviously being part of the program at that time and, and playing alongside you, uh, you were a natural fit. Your, your, your game intelligence was through the roof. And, you know, although there's a lot of nuances to the position, to your point, it takes time. I don't care how old you are. It's a new position. And uh, it was great to work with you, Kadish. And right from the beginning, you were solid. So uh, it, I'm glad it's really paid off for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, yeah, it took a lot of uh, control, like learning the position, um, when to step, when to drop, uh, just reading cues. I think that comes over the years and it's still, you can still always tweak it and get better and better. Right, even right now as well. Mm -hmm. I think right out of the gate with watching you play, your aggressiveness, what you never missed a beat. You've always been aggressive on the pitch. Uh, you seem like your timing has always been there. So physically, the package has always been there. Um, I'm wondering maybe vocally, you know, do you, do you feel comfortable kind of yelling? Do you feel comfortable barking orders? Where are you on that front? Because I can tell you, seeing goalkeepers, never quiet uh and a lot of center backs never quiet but you know i don't i don't know if i've ever seen you as vocal out there do you, do you feel like that's part of your game is that changing or you're like no yeah. i'll let my tackles do the talking <laughs> yeah that's definitely changing i think at the beginning um just not knowing the role so much and this working along like world class center backs i feel like i was really quiet because i just felt like okay Carmelino will talk, like, I don't have to talk, like, a lot of, like, I had a lot of strong center backs um, with me, so I just assume I didn't need to talk, because there's a lot of, like, even Rin Wilkinson, like, just a lot of vocal people around me, and then as I started to see them, like, kind of, like, despair, I was just like, okay, who's gonna, who's gonna step up and take that position, and who's gonna be vocal in the back, and then that's where I started to, like, really um, gain confidence in speaking, and speaking loud. Well, let's take a little bit of break and do some rapid fire questions. Um, you can feel free to answer quickly or you can elaborate on your answers before I even get to my first one. So I'm going to go first, then Laura's going to ask, then Carm, uh, then me and then Laura again. Mine has to do with a pregame playlist, but just a moment here because I did read somewhere. You did an interview and your favorite, is it still a pregame meal or pancakes? Yes, I love pancakes still. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if it's like the national team. So, yeah, so even if it's like a 9 p.m. game, you are having pancakes. Pancakes, yeah. This is very, like, easy to digest, easy to eat. Um, and even when you're nervous, like, pancakes, it's easier to eat than chicken and or pasta. Like, I feel like that's too heavy for me. 
How do you take your pancakes? Like, <laughs> is there bacon? Like, what are we talking here? Is syrup, jam? Like, where do we go? I wish, I wish, I mean, if there was bacon there, I think I would have took it up. Food, but um, <laughs> normally just fruits, uh, banana, uh, strawberries, I like uh, a few, few spices. Sounds much more rational than bacon and maple yeah. syrup. Yeah, sure. No one is going to argue with pancakes. I just find it so, I was like, pancakes? Okay, I like that. All right, so then here's the first question. We've, we've now, we, we now know what your pregame meal is. Who on the national team puts together the best pregame playlist? Uh, Steph Labby. I mean, she's, she's in charge, so I think that'll, that's an easy one. What kind of music is it? Uh, she like kind of mixes it up. Like she'll send out like a WhatsApp, send in your, send in your stuff. And then she'll kind of make the playlist out of that. I can only Jay's imagine dead. the variety. Yeah. The variety is probably a bit, yeah. Off the wall. <laughs> no, but she does a good job of like keeping it like in a good, good beat. Nice. Good. What do you send in? If she's asking you today to send in your pregame playlist, what are you sending in? I'll send in like broke it down. So I'm like reggae, like up tempo, uh, <laughs> something with a reggae sauce style to it. Fair enough. Very good. I like it. Um, whose playlist would be the worst if you were giving somebody else the, the keys to the car? I would probably say like Diana Matheson. No! <laughs> <laughs> Just cause like, I feel like we're so different and yeah, sorry, D. <laughs> no. What no. would D be? Like, are we talking like jazz or something? What What would Diana I'm play? Talking about like, like podcasts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, not, it's not even music, it's podcasts. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Podcast compilations. So enticing. Um, oh, so enticing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to talk to Dee about that one. Oh, um, I think I just exposed you, Dee. I'm super sorry. I'm super, <laughs> it's all part sorry. of the fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to say the truth. So that's yeah. good. Um, <laughs> next question for you. How many pairs of shoes do you own? <laughs> Frozen? <laughs> oh, I think she's frozen. She might have to come back. That you know what? Diana's watching the show and she got very upset at that <laughs> with the podcast. And so she cut Kadisha she off. She cut her internet. <laughs> she said, I will show you. And she That's cut her down. Good. So I'm sure yeah, she'll be uh, yeah. she'll be joining us shortly. We'll get her back on. We have the powers that be who know more about technology oh, than we what the heck that is. There you go. We got you. We were asking you about your shoes. How many pairs of shoes do you own? Maybe in particular running shoes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I don't know. Over, I don't know. Don't like, be shy. Say it. Okay, so like maybe over 50. <laughs> I was going to guess that. I thought maybe more over like 50 in like Michael Jordan shoes. So like that's not even counting like just regular running shoes, regular Air Maxes. <laughs> okay. So. That's a perfect segue, Kadisha, because you have uh, MJ Mondays, all right? Yeah. So how did that start? And uh, what would you say your favorite pair of MJ shoes on? So yeah, like what's this MJ Monday, Michael Jordan Monday thing? Uh, I don't know how it started, but I just, I, I love um, Michael Jordan and I love, his, love to wear his shoes. Um, obviously I had like five, six sisters, so they're all, they all had MJs and when we used to go back to school shopping, um, I never got Michael Jordans because they're super expensive and I was the youngest and it's, I'll get shoes from like Payless or whatever. Because I used to play soccer and I'm not gonna, you can't play soccer in like, in like Jordans. Like it's, you can't do that. My mom wouldn't like that. She spent like $120 on shoes that I'm just gonna kick soccer in. So that was out of the picture. So when I got older, um, started getting my own money, and so I started buying my own shoes. Very nice. <laughs> my favorite pair would be um, Jordan One Classic. Yes, good choice. Mm -hmm. Really good. Thank I need you. to buy myself a pair, by the way. Yeah, Laura, you get the last question here. Um, I have to slide one in before I'm gonna have two. I'm gonna steal this show. Sorry. Where do you keep the shoes? <laughs> like. I have a friend who keeps all his shoes in the shower because he doesn't have room for the shoes. <laughs> he keeps them in the closet. Well, 
I keep I keep my shoes I keep my shoes in the spare room. So oh, whole room. Yeah. Great. It's the spare room. Fill it up with shoes. That's what it's there for. Yeah, Fair exactly. Enough. Um, so you love MJ. Are you watching The Last Dance? I haven't started it yet. I'm trying to finish Money He's so yeah. Well, I'm telling you, you're not gonna be disappointed with the last dance. No. So yeah. we're gonna have to check back in with you when you actually do start watching it just to get your impression. Okay, fair enough. I like that. Uh, we do have a question. So we're, we're live right now on YouTube and we do have somebody writing in that uh, you, uh, Ashley Lawrence Ida Matheson spent time playing in Ottawa in the W League. How important is it for women's soccer in Canada in particular to have its own women's league one day? So a Canadian soccer league. We know the CPL uh, launched mm -hmm. last year for the men. So mm -hmm. how important do you think it is also for Canadian women to have their own league? Um, I think it's important because I feel like a lot of our players growing up, um, we think it's only in America. Um, you, you only can go to like a D1 scholarship to, to get recognized and to, to have a better professional um, soccer career. And I feel like if we have a league in Canada, a lot of players will stay in and actually join and play in the league. So I think it's better for Canada as well. And like all our players not going over to America to play. So I think we'll have a better, better showing in Canada and have our better players playing in Canada as well. We asked uh, your pal DJ Diana Matheson uh, when she was on what it would mean for her to be able to play for a Toronto team to be able to sort of walk out on the field and, and play there. You've obviously played in Toronto before for the national team. What would it be like to have Toronto uh, on your jersey? I, I would love it uh, to, to play at home and to play in front of your friends and family. And I think Toronto has a crazy atmosphere for sports in general and to put one in soccer um, on, on that uh, scenery, I think we'll have a big support. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And of course, it's a sort of a dream come true. And, you know, the question does remain, and I don't know how you feel about this, uh, Keish, but if and when that league comes, right, that we're all sort of working really hard on, uh, you know, it's going to take years to get to the place where you're, you're in the best possible environment for your development in France, on Lyon, best team in the world. Like, it'd be, you know, it would probably be for the other women that don't get these opportunities that you've earned, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but again, that pull towards playing for your heart in front of your, your mom and dad and siblings and everybody who would get that chance, it's hard to, to turn down. It's hard to say it wouldn't be appealing, but you're in a great, pretty great environment right now. So I'd say uh, it's the right place for you. Would you agree? Yeah, even though like, and I think like a lot of players would want like a change or whatever. And if that was my change to go back to back home and play on home soil, I will take that in our heartbeat. Like, yeah. I think I've been in France for for quite a while now. So I think like anything, anything is possible at this point now as well. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That's totally fair. So let's let's talk about your time uh, in France. So it was announced 2017 that you were going to go play in Division One there, uh, Olympique Lyonnais, also known as Lyon. Which, by the way, you guys won the champion, like the title from 2007. Certainly, uh, yeah, it's been. I don't, I don't know how far back it goes, but it's been it's been a while. Yeah. Anyways, it's it's pretty incredible. Literally, I mean, you're on a 13 year streak since 2007. <laughs> yeah. So you joined 2017. 2018, it was announced that you signed an extension to there till 2022. Um, before we get into just, you know, you being there and your, your experience culturally also being in France, I'm curious to know your reaction because I believe it was the Dutch leagues first who announced cancellation. Then because of the French government saying really nothing until September, I guess the sports leagues in France felt their hands were tied. So they just decided to cancel their seasons across the board as well. Men... Uh, and women. How did you handle that news? Um, personally, I think it was the right decision because um, it just keep getting postponed, postponed, postponed. So I feel like a lot of players like we're, we're working, we're still like, even though like 
soccer is not playing, we're still doing behind the scene work, um, trying to stay in the game, trying to stay fit. And if it keeps getting postponed, 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 I feel like you're not going to have a summer and you're not, you're not going to have a break. Cause if that doesn't yeah. get canceled at a certain point, then we're going to go into the next season and then that's going to be difficult. So I think to me, I, I didn't mind the decision that it being canceled, obviously I miss it, but um, at the end of the day, if it's not safe to play, then it's not safe to play. Mm -hmm. I found the unknown is what was dry. Like I, I keep hearing that from athletes. It's mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, we can maybe even talk about the Olympic decision here, where they finally made the decision to postpone. A lot of Olympic athletes keep kept using the word relief. Like now we know we we now know there's another target, there's another date. So to your point, we know how to plan our training. We know how to plan off season if that's kind of what we're going into i think the unknown that carrot that's constantly dangling can sometimes drive you more crazy exactly the unknown is it's, it's scary as well and mm -hmm. i rather like the olympics being postponed and canceled so i i i, I, I have no worries it's okay next year there's going to be an olympics and that, that's something to look forward to as well great perspective the very mature of you Kish. i love that <laughs> You're ready, no farm. <laughs> okay, so you, you definitely agree um, with the decision. So here's another one. Now you're, so you play in France. How, how would you say that playing in that league has helped with your development? Um, for sure, um, the help just playing with like world-class players. I feel like there's a lot of great players um, on this team. And um, I would say like, going back from West Virginia to, to Olympic Lyonnais, um, a lot of people might say it's a big jump um, in a sense that like, I know with my national team that like, there's high player, there's high quality players, but you're not with them 24 seven day in day out. So you can, you can manage that. You can be like, okay, 10 days, put in a strong effort and okay, we're good. Um, going to professional, so going to professional soccer and being at um, Olympic Lyonnais, it's like, you're at the top level day in, day out, week by week, month by month. So I think that was the most difficult part um, going in. You can't, you can't really have a bad day. You always got to go in and improve and, and, and excel um, to the best you can be. Interesting. Yeah. What's, um, what's been the biggest adjustment like in your personal routines? You know, what have, you said you have to be on every day. So how do you yeah. make sure that happens? Like, that's an interesting, that's, I'm actually personally interested in that. How do you make sure that's the case? Um, I think for me, it was like, my biggest shift was um, not really watching what the other players are doing or um, how can you be the best and how can not push yourself to the limit, not other, other people's limit. So you can see like, Wendy and Gridge, like they're doing some crazy stuff that I can't do, and I'm not gonna try to do what they're doing. You know, like I have my my own skills, and and I I can manage myself, so I'm not really trying to fit into what they're doing. More do what I can do best, and then that's how I've been kind of going about my ways. Because um, I there's no I'm not trying to match with no one. I'm just trying to be better for my own development. Yeah, I learned that way too late in my career. So the fact that you know that now, that's fantastic. That, that is uh, the biggest difference to compare it yourself really to your personal best. That's amazing. I do want to ask you, because we had Janine Becky on playing with mm -hmm. uh, Manchester City, and she, she was discussing uh, how they also share the facilities with the men's team. Do you do the same? Um. Well, semi, like I feel like um, there's – numerous of pitchers and we, all all the pitchers are a class so i feel like we share that there's always good quality fields um we do have our separate gyms um obviously well the women's are a bit smaller but some one or two times per month we will probably go in the men's gym and they have more equipment and more things to do um meal wise um, oh what a tease i need to hear about this you know, meal wise i'm like tell me everything is there pancakes how what's the quality like <laughs> yeah, <do> my seat. <laughs> she, she's gonna end up jumping back on and we're, we are going to get the answer to that I guess it's technically a crepe in french right 
the first time I had a crepe was in France and it's phenomenal. But that's what I want to get into the cultural side with her too. Yeah. So when she gets back on, right? Like, what is it? Uh, and I mean, there we go. Okay. Kadisha, you tease us, but you're talking about food. You are not allowed to cut off at that moment because we're like vultures over here when it comes to food. So, so what were you saying about shared food facility? Yeah, we, there's this, uh, we have two chefs. I think uh, they go back and forth and they have their side and we have our side and we, when breakfast, you can order whatever you want, eggs. Um, not, there's no bacon, so. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you can order eggs over easy, scrambled, whatever you like. Um, for lunch, there's always like a meal for the vegans. Um, you know, if you want a fish or a meat, so you can either order chicken, whatever's on the menu, you can, and then they'll make it right on the spot. So you tell them what you want, they'll put it on the grill for you, and yeah, you enjoy. Bon appetit. <laughs> I'm so jealous right now. So what's a, what's a French dish that maybe you never had before that you're you're eating now? Like what, like a French cuisine that you maybe like, okay, that's actually now one of my favorites. No. That's cargo. No. No, 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 no. I don't really, I'm not a big fan of the the, the, the French food and the French cuisine. <laughs> I because I feel like French people are like, they're very like delicate and they like their meat and their fish yeah. very like raw and like, yeah. you know, and I'm more like a bien cuit, like very well done kind of gal. So <laughs> yeah, that's why. Yeah. Okay. What is your all time favorite dish anyways? All time favorite dish? Mm, I'll more go on like the culture side of Jamaican side of me. Like I have like curry gold, yum, um, oxtail. Mm. I don't know, just no really flavorful, seasoned food. And he's like, yeah. no thanks, I'm good. <laughs> oh. When you said the <laughs> lots, lots, here. yeah, <laughs> lots and lots of seasoning. You season everything, and that's mm -hmm. what I love. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of seasoning. Mm -hmm. now, listen, I'll do tofu curry. Don't judge me. Okay. Laura. What was it like going from West Virginia to France, like personally mm -hmm. off the field? Like, is that a culture shock? Do you speak French? Do you have to learn the language? How do you get from point A to point B? Yeah, it was definitely a difference between just America in every part of the world. Um, um, with France, obviously, I I wouldn't say I spoke French flu fluently, but I did learn it in school. So okay. I feel like um, French was a good place for me instead of going to like Germany where I know like zero, zero Dutch. Um, yeah. So going to France, knew a little bit of French going in. I'm still learning, not fluent, but I, I understand a lot. I feel like the French um, language is hard for me to speak. I don't know, maybe because I'm just like too, Jam too Jamaican instead of Canadian, but like the, how I speak, it's like, it's so difficult, it's so difficult. Um, but going from West Virginia to, mm -hmm. to France, um, just the food is different. Um, there's not a lot of food chains as well. So you so I'm doing a lot of cooking. That was okay. kind of new for me. So like, you know, being at being in college, eating dorm, like you mm -hmm. just go to the, yes. the yeah. cafeteria, I have a lot of cat food and stuff. So to cooking <laughs> constantly and on your own, I think that was different. Um, the language is different for sure. Mm -hmm. And just the I think it's just the atmosphere, the coaching yeah. style. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I speaking to a lot of um, like we take it for granted, right? When you're in North America and people from another country come to play here, you just don't even think about how their life is if English is a second language to them until I hear of athletes who go to a country where the language is not English first. And it's the simple things like mm -hmm. go to the grocery store and asking where food is in an aisle. Like, I, I don't know if that's where suddenly something that should come so naturally you can't spit it out. You can't find the words for it. Asking for directions, dialing up for eats or so, I don't know. Like, how do you just get on the phone with somebody? And it's like things that you almost take for granted because it just, you know, English is your first language. I mean, what were maybe some of the things that kind of frustrate you when you can't communicate? Going to the cleaners to get your clothes.
clothes. I mean, I don't know. You no, know, for me, like if you know me, I'm I'm not really the type to ask a lot of questions. Even in Canada, if I don't know where something is, I'm gonna look instead of asking a person for it. So even in France, I'm like, even if I don't know where something is, I'm just gonna go about my way and find it myself. And if I can't find it, I'd be like, oh well, whatever. So I think that's that's kind of like my personality I'm kind of shy when I like going out and asking people questions and things I kind of like mm-hmm. figure it out myself um very quiet um but um does google translate <laughs> simple does google <laughs> translate answer. everything yes yeah technology greatest exactly. invention amazing yeah. so so I have to say, you know, obviously, uh, personality, I'm a little bit opposite. So I went, when I played in Italy, two second story, I lived, um, I spoke growing up, but I started using the dialect that my parents taught me. So I would say the wrong word in Northern Italy when my parents are from South and everybody would make fun of me. So I went to school. <laughs> I made sure that I had to like learn so people wouldn't make fun of me. That was my motivation actually to mm-hmm. speak fluently. But anyway, so you have your friends down the street, you know, you have a- Ashley Lawrence and you have Jordan Heidema. Like how do you get to communicate with them about these challenges? Do you get to see them? How is it having people sort of in your backyard city wise close enough? Um, well, Ash is quite fluent and she's very, very fluent and Jordy, not so much, but I think at the beginning, um, we did laugh about like the French culture and their, <laughs> and they being like very like nonchalant and very late. Um, <laughs> we'll meet at eight and we'll like most of the players would be down at like 7.50, 7.55. The French girls come down at like 8, 8.01, 8.02, they're strolling in. So we kind of laugh about like that side of things and yeah. Mm-hmm. You're lucky it's only two or three minutes late. If you were in Italy, you'd be waiting for half an hour for people to It's okay to make a whole hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say six o'clock, you're showing up yeah. at seven. Um, what, what was it like uh, as well going from a national team where you're in the starting 11, no matter what, like we know it. If anything, it looks odd if you're not in the starting 11. So what is it like going from a, a team where you're in there to maybe in, in the pro ranks where, you know, it's, it's a good battle for that position and to be a regular in the lineup all the time. How do you, how do you marry those, that mentality, right? In, in the two different worlds. Um, it's kind of interesting because I felt like I learned a lot um, just not being the starting 11 and, and really learning more about myself and how was I able to manage just being just a starting level, starting level, like being on a starting lineup, I guess most of my life um, to going to OL and starting, not starting, not starting, maybe starting. So I think it, it, it is, and it can get difficult, but at the end of the day, um, I feel like playing or not playing, um, I'm still improving. Um, and I think that's the mindset I had, even though I'm not playing this game, I'm, I'm still improving. And I think that's why I'm still, there I think a lot of players would leave and because they're not getting playing time but I feel like for myself I'm still I'm still improving a lot and then I think that's and that's what's keeping me satisfied and stay sane as well that I'm still able to to find ways to to better myself and I think I've 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 learned a lot um by not starting um how starters people don't start feel that I never felt before so I think bringing that to like the national team and more cognitive, cognitive, cognitive? Cognizant, of yeah. like oh, yeah, yeah of like exactly. how people feel and like maybe how to act how to not to act like what questions you know you just get more of a feel of how the non-starters feel and how how can you help them in a way to make them still feel a part of the team mm-hmm. that's amazing great what answer was the way that it taught you about yourself like what have you learned um, I think, I think, well, a lot of players, like, even though, like, I'm not starting there, I have, I'm starting on another team, so I can't, I can't let that deter me and, and, and me start thinking that, like, I'm not good enough to, to, to make that starting lineup, because I know I am, it's just, it's just a coach decision, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, mm-hmm. but for me, I'm not, I'm not gonna shut down, because, other 
people and other players in my whole country is counting on me mm-hmm. when they need me in, in the time of need. So I can't dwell on like not starting. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have, I still have to, to improve and, and find other ways. If I don't start, I have to go, go run after the game, do something after, um, even though I'm not starting because I still need to keep in shape. I still need to keep, keep fit. Um, but when my national team calls me and I'm able to perform. So does the, having that bigger vision, that, that's a driving force. And, and I know, I mean, I don't want to say it for you, but I know your family is a huge part of this too. You're playing for your family, uh, mm-hmm. for Canada. You know, these are some big motivating factors that you may, may not get caught up in the everyday decisions because uh, you got some big picture things going on in the background. So yeah, well said, well done. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's, there are two things, you know, you had said that had caught my attention and, and just speaking of like the honor of representing your country and also knowing, you know, the, the responsibility that comes with that and not wanting to let them down. You said there's only two groups of people who get to represent their country and you said, you know, the troops and the athletes and it's, it's just so true. The more you think about that, you're like, okay, right? You get to wear that maple leaf and truly represent your country. And speaking now also of learning more about yourself, um, you know, playing uh, in France and just the different role, you had also, this this interview I think was a while back, but you had talked about a breakthrough you felt in your career. This was very early on, was at Nationals in St. John's. So you actually played a year up, you were playing under 16, um, Mm -hmm. I think provincial team, so probably around, you know, 2010. How many breakthroughs would you say you've had throughout your career where you just keep learning about yourself and being open to that, right? Almost understanding that it's a learning process all the way through. Um, uh, I think, again, we spoke about this not playing. I feel like that was a breakthrough to me um, because I feel like that was, it can be the lowest point of your playing career, not starting every game not playing every game but that made me be an even more stronger player mentally and not letting that deter me and and steer me away from my dreams I so I feel like that was a big learning for me and I feel like it wasn't easy at first to to, to see that um because at first you want to play but as you think about it and you go about your day you have to turn that into a positive and I think that wasn't easy at first I can't say that I always thought about that no um it was it was sad some days not not getting to start but at the end of the day I, I came up with the learning um my other breakthrough moment maybe it'll probably when I played at home at the rematch against USA I kind of felt like this is where I wanted to be for the rest of my life because I felt like even though we lost that game, I feel, I felt like I gave it my all. And it was just so like, I don't know, it was a moment where I just like, I love this team and I, this is my team for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I know that certainly you're going to grow throughout your career, but like at what point do you think that you might hit your prime? I mean, center backs are generally veteran sort of players. You're still so young. I feel like you've been around forever, but you're look at your age and you're like, oh damn, she's still so young. Like at what point do you think you will feel fully yourself and hit that? Good question. Um I certainly don't know when I'm gonna hit my peak. Uh but I don't know. I think every day I, sh- I strive to be a better better player. And I'm not sure when, because I feel like every, every time you feel like you want to learn something more, you want to improve something. So at one point where I feel like I have it all, I don't know. And I hopefully I don't think, I don't know if that time will come because I feel like I'm just a player who likes to improve and, and um, I don't always, I don't always, I don't always want to be the same player. Like I want to get better and better. So I don't want to come to a point where I'm like, I have it all. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, I don't, I don't want to get to that point. But I don't know. I don't know. Well, the game is continually evolving. To your point, you know, future center backs are going to look different than current center backs, and we know that. What skills will be required? And, you know, usually people decide for you when you've hit your peak. That's the interesting mm-hmm. part. I don't know if you agree, but it's on a world stage, you know, that you've done well at a World Cup or an Olympics and everyone says, mm-hmm. wow, she's arrived. 
when really it's what you're saying. You're working every day to become better mm -hmm. and you're always yeah. the best that you are at this time, you know, like right yeah. now. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like am I am I am I people might think of that I'm at my prime right now. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Maybe next year they'll say that I don't know. It's just <laughs> that's that's an unknown. A lot of people would uh certainly fans of the Canadian team would struggle to find faults in your game. Where are areas that you want to improve? Um, I would say my communication, I still, I feel like that's always a big area for me to improve. And I feel like even after, I think it's the most when, um, t when our team changes, um, when people retire that you always find like, who's going to step up, who's going to be that, that person for our team. So I think as the team changes, you find, it's like, how can you can you step up? So I feel like right now I'm still I'm still um, learning how to be a leader. I'm still trying to be a leader. So I think that's always going to be an ongoing thing for me because I feel like that's one of my areas that I can improve the most. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, my other goal would just be scoring more. So I think that's my area. Interesting. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Nice yeah. You, do you have like um? Do you do you visualize what a perfect goal would look like for you? Is it a bicycle kick? Is it a flying header? Or you just bounce it off your butt? You don't care as long as it goes in. <laughs> I don't really care as long as it goes in. So I think it's just being more tenacious um, on corners and in balls, just being more hungry. Okay. Uh, let's have another little rapid fire round here. And I feel like, so I told you we're vultures. So this one's gonna take the theme of food over here. But you did say earlier, obviously, so Jamaican food, that seems to be your go-to, I get it. But living in France, if you did have a go-to dish that was more of the French cuisine, uh, what would it be? Do you have a sweet tooth? Are we going crepes at all and like ice cream and stuff? Not really big fan of crepes, um, but gelato ice cream for sure. I love gelato ice cream. Okay, so you're not going to uh, back on that. What else? Croissant? Um, I get. It. I'm a carb lover. I'm taking all this down. Not, not, I'm not really a croissant lover, but I'm not a baguette lover. But a croissant, I'll take a croissant. I love croissant. Okay. You're um, like, don't mess with my pancakes. I take pancakes, normal pancakes. Don't mess. Yeah. With them. Uh, they 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 eat a lot of fish there, so um, I'm down for some seafood. Okay. All right, Carm, you're up next with your question. Totally. Sorry, I'm gonna have to ask what gelato flavor. I'm curious. I like the Nutella flavor. Guys, okay. I hate Nutella. I don't, I like, I don't know. And the Ferrero, do you know the Ferrero Rocher flavor? Yes. Oh, that's, that's, the that's one. not, so in Italian we call that nocciola. Yes, nocciola. we take that down like nothing. What do you mean, Laura? <laughs> Nutella was like the goat for every Italian kid. You take the cracker, you put the Nutella on it, you take the other cracker, you squeeze it, you watch it ooze through the holes, and then you eat it. <laughs> Guys, I'm Dutch. I like butter my toast and I put chocolate sprinkles on it. Like I, I like it's called hockleslaw, and it's just it's just like regular chocolate that melts into the bread, which most people are like, that's disgusting. But I can't get into the Nutella thing. I don't know. Wow. I'll wow. try it again. I'll try it again. Okay. All right. Uh, that's an interesting fact. It's uh, learned a lot about you, Laura. I don't know. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> <And> next, <laughs> next one for you, Keish. Um, first food you, you ate when you came back to Canada, like the first dish you were craving? Um, I would say oxtail. Yum. Really good. I, I enjoy that myself. And he's like, what the, what is yeah, that? <laughs> Oxtail, oh my God. You what turned her that? right off. <laughs> I'm like, the tail? <laughs> Yum, really good. I don't even, even know what it is, but I love Oxtail. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, the next question was supposed to be best food, French, Canadian, or Jamaican, but I feel like we kind of landed on Jamaican already. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. ask you, if could, you learn to cook, if mm -hmm. you're hosting us for a meal, what is your specialty? Um, I I mean, do you guys like chicken? Yeah. yeah. I like I cook a mean barbecue chicken. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I'll take it. 
Okay. Just make some French fries for me. I'll have some French fries. You can never go wrong with the potato for me. (laughs) You can't go wrong with some French fries. Mm. No way. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the potato is so good. Um, I guess so. So I think what are maybe some of the habits you've picked up uh, in France? Whether, no, I'll leave this up to you. Habits maybe on the pitch or maybe habits living on your own, kind of being on your own in your own country? Like, what is it that you maybe even learned about yourself domestically? I, I mean, I don't know, maybe you're really good at laundry, maybe ironing, maybe, maybe no, maybe you hate all that, maybe. <laughs> oh, ask my French peeps about me doing laundry and ironing. And when I first moved there, I have in France, there's like a washer dryer in one. Oh. oh. Hmm? it's it's the worst there's a washer and dryer in one how does that really? happen is it, it's like the the shampoo and conditioner in one it doesn't make sense <laughs> it doesn't work. so my stuff will come out my white practice jersey will come out like pinkish like grayish <laughs> um my shirts are like crumpled and like yeah they they'll they'll make fun of me time to time but oh well that's you haven't figured it out <laughs> no i haven't figured it out yet it's difficult um or sometimes my clothes will come out like super drenched like, like <laughs> how am i supposed to practice tomorrow like it is soaked i'm like i don't know i don't know i don't know and sometimes like my patch will stick together like it'll be like oh i'll patch and i'm just like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> moving on <laughs> So laundry is definitely not one of them. Okay. So I didn't really have a lot of hobbies or habits because I was in school. So I think a lot of my time was spent doing my homework. Did you major in criminology? No, and I, like I didn't the way, don't think we didn't catch that. I was doing homework. A lot of homework. Um, no, I didn't major. I majored in multidisciplinary studies. It's where you take three minors as one major yeah that's totally that's smart I mean who knows at 17 what they want to study like not too many people I didn't anyway yeah I just Um, really just wanted to get a degree mm -hmm. I did that okay so uh next question for me last sort of rapid fire who's your best friend in France and why uh Shanice Van de Sande because she's a cool (laughs) cool human being and we just clicked uh, we didn't really click at first, but um, just took us like a few months to really understand each other and we just became super close. Okay, so I have a question that we talked about in our pre-show meeting yesterday <laughs> that's ridiculous and our producer is going to be like, Laura, do not ask this question. She wears lipstick during the game, right? And she right. like always looks perfect at the end. How does yeah. she put lipstick on? Because I like put lipstick on before this show and it's already half gone. Well, I guess it depends on what kind of lipstick you put it on. If it's, it's if it's Mac, it'll probably stay on. You know what I mean? Like, yes, you guys, I don't understand. It's that long wear stuff. Oh, darn. Yeah, you gotta get so that like waterproof no lipstick. Oh. I don't know. I don't know what lipstick she wears, but she definitely she looks, looks good. good. When she she looks plays. Like after ninety mm-hmm. minutes, she looks fantastic. Mm. You have some incredible players on that team. I mean, obviously yourself included, and I had alluded to it earlier that Leon has won the title since 2007. Um, mm-hmm. Such a strong team. Ada Hegeberg as well. Um, what would you say has been maybe like some of the players on your team where seeing them in person, seeing them play has made you go, wow, right? Like, you know, pretty incredible. Um, like as a... Just any, because sometimes when you see people yeah. play on TV or you hear about them, but then now they're your actual teammate and you get to see mm-hmm. them up close and personal every day. Does yeah. it maybe take it to another level? Like, listen, I knew she was good, but maybe I didn't know she was that good. Uh, I feel like there's two sides to this question because I feel like playing with like a person like Wendy Renard, who's very tenacious and very aggressive on the field and then off the field, she's like a sweetheart. And she's very caring, loving, and such a great leader. Um, yeah, and I think just playing playing alongside of her and playing and watching her play, like the amount of goals she scores, like it's ridiculous. Like she's she she has um 
all around like great player. Uh, so I think if that answers your question, like there's a lot of players on my team that I didn't think I would like. You know, some players like you don't like to play against. Oh yeah. Um, they're just very like nasty, but off the field they're cool. I'm like, okay, I can work with you. Um, but yeah, they feel like there's a whole bunch of players. Like I think the oh like my team there's like great individuals. A lot of great individuals. Just, I want to just follow up with that because in 2015, we had alluded to being named FIFA World Cup, you know, the Young Player Award. But that year, you were also mm -hmm. nominated for Ballon d'Or. Mm -hmm. um, what was your reaction to that and being nominated for such a prestigious award? Um, just a surreal feeling. I feel like it just all happened at once. I feel like from one tournament, you just get so many like recognition. Mm -hmm. And like I feel like everything was just like popping up here, popping up there, popping up there. I'm just like, oh, okay. Uh, um, but yeah, like I, I like I guess I had a good tournament or like what's this? Um, but yeah, I think it was very cool um, just to get a few nominations and um, yeah, I just thought it was a cool, cool experience and yeah. Humble pie, humble pie. You had some before you uh, got on the call. So thanks for that. I know you're so, I would be like, listen, I was also named this. I won this. <laughs> By the way, did you know this? <laughs> like, I mean, 2015 was an incredible year for you, but it was also a launch yeah. you had, right? Like, I think that's mm -hmm. what also catapulted you into being a household name for a lot of Canadians um, as well. And it, you can already tell that you're not somebody who rests on your laurels either. There's always the next step, next step, what's next, right? But I mean, I think, I think time, part of it was my my long red dreads that a lot of people just yes. remember. I, I love I those. Think it's like, Iconic. Let me tell you, after that World Cup, when I, I couldn't even like walk around because I just, I still had that long red dreads in and people were like, oh my gosh, let me tell you, as soon as I took those bad boys out, <laughs> barely, barely, come on. But it was so funny. Are it's they going to make a contact? We were missing them yesterday. We were talking about how much we missed them. Yeah. yeah. True story. That was the first thing I said. We got on the call. Yeah. I'm like, who's going to ask Kadisha about those red dreads? Because I want them back. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe. The women's yeah, like, cool. team has a great history of great hair. Like, Erin used to have great hair. Carm, you had great hair. Kadisha, you have great hair. Who's the next great hair moment? Um, we don't know. Not not anyone. <laughs> no one jumps out. On the team yet. Yeah, no one jumps out. There's no Karina with the, the Mohawk. Yeah, Karina, yeah. No Karina. I think Steph sometimes. Oh, Sophie. I think Sophie oh, does oh, a yeah. lot of crazy hair. Yeah. And I love it. The short, she has different short hair colors yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Listen, I, that to me, like, was it Neymar at the 2018 World Cup? Didn't he have three different hairstyles in one week? I can't even get a hair appointment. <laughs> With my hairdresser, like I get once every three months, this guy has three different hairstyles in one week. Yeah. But that's part of the, uh, that's part of the entertainment value, I guess. Um, now, Laura, I know you had a question as well, just because the growth of the women's game and in particular, right, the, the Jamaican team. Yeah, we know, I mean, you've grown up, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know that you've grown up playing alongside some of the girls who are women who are now playing for the Jamaican women's national team. There's a lot of Canadians on that team. Like, how have you seen that team in particular, but also teams across the CONCACAF region grow? And what are you expecting from them sort of in the next little while in terms of sort of pushing Canada? Um, good question. I feel like, I think it comes from the world and their support from like their federations to really improve um, the women's side. I feel like at one point before Jamaica had no pay, I feel like before that they had um, Cydia Marley or so someone taking great interest into their team. And I feel like that played a big role for them and their belief um, to being one of the best in Caribbean. And I feel like, I think that that shows like how a support and, and a few people, um, the support that they need. 
<laughs> oh, we're going to get her back for that one. Yeah. I mean, listen, that was a big talking point, right? When we were again yeah. doing that Olympic qualifier and looking at a lot of those teams who had obviously been through turnover on the coaching side of things, maybe not even having full-time coaches, uh, fighting for equality, especially yeah. when it came to finances, right? So the Jamaican team was very much in there. And to your point, yeah. Laura, like a lot of them are Canadian girls. Yeah, and for anybody who doesn't know, she is the daughter of Bob Marley. It's the the, the, mm. the foundation who is, I mean, sunk, a, put a lot of money into that federation, offered them a lot of support. And certainly it seems like it's been really re, like sort of uh, rejuvenating for, for that mm. federation in a lot of ways as players. Mm -hmm. So I think we're working on getting Kid Kadisha back. Oh, there she is. We see you, Kadisha. Hi. Hey, you're back. All right, we have one more question for you before we let you go. Oh, she's. I think her. I think her internet's just done with us, or maybe it's still there. All right. I think we there's too many Zoom more. calls. Yeah, we're gonna keep our fingers crossed for this one because I think this is gonna be a good message if we can get you to sign off on this one. Yeah. Message to young girls and chasing their dreams and wanting to you know, play soccer or anything in life, as somebody who has achieved so much in their life and continues to do so, what would be your message to young women? Oh, we were so close. We were so close. Um, sorry about that. But for the message to the young girls, I would say, I love this one. I feel like everyone has a different path and you shouldn't be too worried about what other people are doing and just really focusing on yourself and believing in yourself. And when you do that, you allow more focus on yourself to, to know what you want and what, what can you change in your game. So I think for me, it's you never don't watch what other people are doing around you and just really focus and stay in tune and stay intact with yourself and really listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yes, yeah, no, no two journeys are the same, right? Because I find exactly. a lot of people will look at yours and be like, I want that. Maybe that's not your path and that's okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Kadisha, it has been an absolute pleasure having you here. Kadisha Buchanan, Olympic bronze medalist. Um, if you are wondering, hey, what are you guys talking about when it comes to her over 50 pairs of shoes? Check her out on Instagram um, because you do. You have some really cool shoes. You love your basketball. Like I said, I'd love to check in with you again when you actually get to watch Michael Jordan's The Last Dance, because mm -hmm. your MJ Mondays, I think, will, will take on a, a whole new meaning. So, but, but what's life like now for you as you, you know your season's done? Are you just chilling? Is that is that it? You're in your off season now? Well, my season's not particularly done. I think uh, the French League is done, but you still have uh, Champions League and uh, French Cup right. to maybe take part of. So I'm still here doing my thing, still working out, still trying to keep fit. Um, because we don't know um, about the, the, the rest of the season. So that's, it's still kind of on. Um, so we're just waiting around to see how that goes. Okay. Well, we're happy you were able to make it home, uh, safe and sound. <laughs> Hopefully you can get your nieces back out in France though to uh, enjoy that very beautiful country. We look forward <laughs> to hitting you or seeing you hit the pitch soon as well. Kadisha Buchanan, Olympic bronze medals, ladies and gentlemen, on this edition of One Soccer's Happy Hour. If you turned in halfway through or near the end, don't worry, we're gonna be posting it on the One Soccer YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe. A ton of other great content uh, over there as well with the guys and, and Gareth Wheeler interviewing a lot of uh, big names in soccer around the world. So that is the One Soccer YouTube channel. On behalf of everyone here, thanks for tuning in today. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you.